Hello, everyone. Welcome to Making the Case for Affirming Children's Voices in Early Childhood Nature-Based Initiatives. I'm Kathy Jordan, Children and Nature Network's Director of Research. CNN's mission is to lead a global movement to increase equitable access to nature so that children and natural places can thrive. Today's webinar is focused on lifting children's voices in both research approaches and educational practice to affirm the right of children to participate in matters relevant to them. The Children in Nature Network and Natural Start Alliance, a project of the North American Association of Environmental Education, are collaborating and bringing you this webinar about evidence-based and practice-based information to make the case for affirming the voices, experiences, and cultural ways of knowing of our youngest participants in nature-based education to enhance the child's connection to nature and the developmental benefits of nature's contact. This is the fourth in a regular series of webinars called Making the Case, each one paired with a themed issue of our Research Digest, our monthly email publication featuring brief findings from hot off the press research. You can sign up for the Digest at the URL on this slide, which is also provided at the top of the chat box. The Digest special issue on today's topic was emailed at the end of February to subscribers and is available on the CNNN website. The Research Digest and this webinar series are two legs of the three legs of the research stool at CNNN. The other and most foundational is the Research Library, which houses over 880 summaries of research articles written in accessible lay language. The links to the Research Library as well as the Research Digest are provided at the top of the chat box as well. And making the case webinars explore an issue from both a research and a practice perspective, encouraging a dialogue between these two ways of knowing. The format we'll use today will hopefully facilitate this research and practice exchange. I'll provide some information about how the scientific literature reflects this idea of lifting or affirming children's voices. Our first featured guest, Carrie Green, Associate Professor of Education at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, will then discuss some of her own research, focusing on the research methods she uses to affirm young children's voices in her research studies. We'll then hear from Natalie Lucas, manager and educator at We One's Daycare and Preschool and Valhalla Children's Center in British Columbia. Natalie will tell us the story of Salmon Speaks, a project that demonstrates how even very young children can be active agents in thoughtful discussions about difficult human and environmental issues when their adults lift up their voices. Just a couple of instructions about use of the chat box. Given the number of participants on the call, we'll be using the chat to engage you. We'll choose as many of your questions as you can pose to our panelists during the Q&A section. A lot of the value of these webinars is the information that attendees share with each other. Please feel free to comment and offer resources in the chat. If you want to direct a comment to a webinar attendee, such as responding to someone who has asked a question in the chat, please start your response with that person's name. You can also direct a question to one of the presenters in the same way. Finally, some housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. Please note that all attendees are on mute throughout the webinar. Again, please use the chat box to ask questions or make comments. Let's start with just a little bit of context from the research literature. International agreements, including the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, recognize children's right to have a say in matters that pertain to them. Research attests to the fact that even young children have the ability or agency to exercise this right, especially when adults provide developmentally appropriate outlets for their expression. Not only does research suggest that good educational practice involves an approach that facilitates children's agency in connecting to and caring about and learning about the environment, researchers are beginning to recognize the value of lifting even very young children's voices in the research process itself as well. They're now using a variety of strategies that engage young children as active researchers. I'm going to turn this over to Carrie Green, who's going to talk about how she has done this through her own research. Carrie, are you on mute? Hello. The aim Thank of my you. presentation today is to discuss what it means to engage children as active researchers of culture and change. Today I will share with you some of the research approaches that I have used in studying children's environmental identity development in both Alaskan rural and non-rural contexts. This work has been centered on listening to the voices and perspectives of young children. It is my hope that today you will walk away with tools and ideas of how you can honor children's agency in facilitating projects that are meaningful, important to the young children that you work with. 
Today, I will present five methods, including artistic representations, building a model, role playing, bookmaking, sensory tours, and the use of wearable cameras. Engaging children as active researchers is challenging, particularly with young children. Researchers and educator, educators must continuously walk the fine line of providing guidance and promoting agency throughout the process. We will begin with art making. Like language, art is a symbol system that can be used to generate meaning. In using art as a method, it is important to consider what type of art activities are appropriate for the skill level of children involved in the project. For young children who are still developing their fine motor skills, painting may be more inviting than drawing. In our study, we provided materials for both painting and drawing. An art center was constructed in the forest by placing a large board on four tree stumps for a table and stringing a line between two trees to hang finished artwork. Children were invited to draw or paint about their forest experiences using the medium they prefer preferred. Some did both. Art is a meaning-making process. Through the creation of art, children represent and interpret their own experiences. We invited children to describe their creation in order to record the journey of their constructions of meaning. In this way, focus was placed on the process of meaning making rather than children's artistic abilities or their finished products. One advantage of creating art in the forest is that it allowed for interactions with flora and fauna that could not be had indoors. For example, during one art center session, a caterpillar happened across one child's paper. The teacher at first thought it was a drawn caterpillar. Realizing it was a real caterpillar, the child suggested, I think, I think he wants, I think, I think he thinks it's a tree. Another advantage of this method is that it sets up opportunities for socializing through group, group art making. It also encourages children to engage in discussions about what is meaningful to them. The art table creates a common ground for children to express their particular interests and topics. On the other hand, social influence might pose a limitation. That is, children can be easily influenced by the activities of others around them and might strive to create similar artwork. A child might also try to construct what they perceive the researcher wants rather than authentically express his ideas and perspectives. One way to mitigate social influence is to include multiple methods for children to share their perspectives of their environment. Another possible limitation is that children might create artwork that seems unrelated to the environmental context. It is important, however, not to dismiss a child's creation as irrelevant. Rather, a researcher might invite a children to explain the connection that she is making to a particular setting. Furthermore, there are logistical considerations when facilitating art activities with children, especially in nature, as art making can be messy. Spill-proof containers and non-toxic products support the common goal of preserving our environment. Next, I will talk about building a model. Building and molding, molding is a common feature of childhood play. Children love to explore how stuff fits together and what stuff might become. Children learn best through manipulating materials and seeing what effects it has on the world around them. Through building and molding, children are interpreting and constructing their own sense of place. Children are inclined to manipulate loose parts or objects in nature. Through this activity, children are personally making meaning of the world around them and developing environmental competencies. In our research, we invited children to use natural materials to build models to represent their environmental experiences. First, we provided children with buckets to gather materials. Next, children shaped and glued their objects onto cardboard surfaces, creating miniature worlds to represent both real and imaginary elements. 
After children were done constructing their models, they were invited to describe them. Bug homes, mini villages, tiger huts, tiny lakes and rivers were among the features described by children. One advantage of inviting children to build a model is that it invites children to represent their own particular interests in their environment. For instance, Sergo built his home in the forest. This validated his interest in claiming a place in the forest, which he demonstrated during other data collection activities. Building models gets kids out in their environment. Children further explore and discover the flora and fauna of their places. Catherine, Catherine built a ladybug on a tree, demonstrating her environmental competency of the creatures that she had interacted with in the forest. Children's descriptions of their models provide insight into the social, cultural, geographical, and family influences of their nature experiences. Several children created their houses and described features of their yard. They also talked about going on hikes with a family member or engaging in hunting and gathering activities. A third advantage and disadvantage of uh, building the model method is that children incorporated both real and imaginary elements in their model in order to interpret their surroundings. While this can be viewed as an advantage, especially in considering fantasy play as an important feature of childhood identity development, it might also be perceived as a disadvantage in that their representations might not fully reveal the truth of their lived experiences. Facilitating multiple methods to explore children's experiences provides one way to overcome this. If children repeatedly represent and tell about an experience, then likely it represents a salient aspect of their environmental identity. A possible disadvantage or challenge associated with the building a model method is that it might not be suitable for especially young children who are still developing their fine motor skills. It is important to keep in mind the age and skill level of children when considering this method. It may be challenging for younger children to use liquid glue or cutter-shaped materials into distinct environmental features. Thus, when facilitating this method with young children, researchers may want to employ an ample number of adult or peer assistants. A third method that can be used for gaining insight of children's ideas and perspectives is role playing. Role play requires children to consider ideas from various perspectives and draw upon their own beliefs, values, and experiences. Role playing also pl places children at the center of learning experiences and encourages them to bridge past and present understandings of their environment. Role playing supports children in exercising agency and empowers them to actively engage in problem solving large and small issues. In our research, we created a stage like area for children to role play. A sheet was strung between, between two tarps, a tarp, a tree, a tarp was laid across the forest floor. The puppets and costumes and other prompts were made available for children to act out their forest experiences. First, children were invited to choose their desired role by selecting among costumes or puppets. They were also encouraged to incorporate other materials found in the environment to facilitate their story. We used question prompts to encourage children's role play activities. Role play is a useful data collection method for studying children's environmental experiences. By assuming the role of humans and plants, animals, and or other environmental features, children begin to explore their personal relationship with nature. Additionally, through role playing, children engage in empathetic reasoning and perspective taking. That is, they think about how it might feel to be someone or something else, like a bug, sunflower, or another creature. Furthermore, another advantage of role playing is that it supports children in developing environmental competency. Children assume different aspects of their environment 
and reenact key interactions of living flora and fauna through their perspective. And this way, they demonstrated their understanding of environmental relationships. Teachers can build on children's current understanding and further hone in on important environmental competencies, particularly regarding human interactions with the environment. For instance, a teacher could use role playing to teach children about the appropriate time and method for peeling birch bark from a tree, or how a crane might fill when disrupted while resting on its migratory mission. This encourages children to not only think about how they feel, but also how certain interactions impact other living beings. Thirdly, role playing is fun and engaging for children. Found that children visited the role playing center time and time again. Role playing promotes children's social engagement with peers and when orchestrated outdoors, children are more likely to incorporate elements of the natural world into their role play. Bookmaking can be used to tell the story of the research and create a visual that children can revisit time and time again. We engage children in two complementary bookmaking activities. First, a research big book made out of large flip chart of paper was used to introduce children to the research, capture their ideas, and to document what they did together. Each time we met in the classroom to reflect on their forest experiences, we added new pages to their research big book, including photographs, children's quotes from their discussions, and drawings that they created to represent their experiences. Teachers helped facilitate the discussion and wrote down children's comments on sticky notes. Children were then invited to stick their words on the book page. Children were excited about revisiting pages in their book, which built upon their previous understandings. Second, we invited each child to create a book page to show and tell about their personal experiences in the project. Through this one-on-one -on -one sharing, Children were invited to remember and tell what they liked best. We provided each child with an 11 by 17 sheet of paper, pictures of their previous artwork, photographs of them in the forest, and a variety of craft supplies. As children constructed their book pages, we used questions to invite them to share about their experiences. Books were used to keep record of the research as well as to engage children in data analysis and interpretation. For example, Peter inter interpreted the top left photograph of himself in the forest looking for beetle be beetles. Peter drew bugs on his paper, paper and shared more about his understanding of bugs. This bug has two legs, he explained. The fifth, and perhaps most insightful method that we used in our research is the sensory tour method. During a sensory tour, a child is invited to wear a small wearable video camera, such as a GoPro using a head strap. Positioned on the forehead of a child, the wearable camera captures what children see, hear, say, and touch in their environments. In viewing footage captured in a sensory tour, you nearly feel like you are walking in the shoes of a child. The wearable camera distinguishes when a child turns his or her head, when they look up or down, when they run or fall, and the words that they exchange with others, and sounds and songs that they utter under their breath. It captures their self-talk and expressions and their interactions and exchanges with other people and living and non-living beings in their environment. Wearing the camera is completely voluntary and can last as long as the child is interested. Another advantage of the sensory tour method is that it puts size into perspective. It allows researchers to see how big environmental features in adult and adults appear to a child 
For example, in our research, it became apparent just how challenging and overbearing wild rose bushes can be to young children. The bushes that stand only about knee high to adults tower over some of the children. One child shrieked as he explored a faint trail. Big sticker bushes! There's big sticker bushes right there! Ah! A third advantage of the sensory tour method is that it provides an unobtrusive means to explore children's experiences of the forest without the interference of an adult. Wearable cameras allow children, children to engage in authentic peer interactions undisturbed, removing the need for an adult with a camera looming nearby, pro propping and prodding to capture the nature of children's interactions. A fourth advantage is that sensory tours are more likely to reveal the whole story of children's experiences in their environment than traditional video methods. Traditional video methods typically rely on adults for posi positioning the direction of the camera. And often adult researchers are only able to capture fragments and segments of participants' experiences. Because sensory tours go where a child goes and sees what a child sees, it can tell how many times a child visited a certain place or what events inspired such a visit. Finally, sensory tours are for the most part, part non-intrusive and enjoyable to children. The children in our study expressed that they liked wearing the cameras, indicating that it was one of their favorite activities during the project. While researchers certainly have to ensure the right fit and angle, angle GoPro cameras are durable and can withstand most roughhousing in the environment including camera bull fights. The following example shows the perspective of a young child picking blueberries on the tundra. It reveals movement over the uneven terrain of the Arctic tundra, providing insight of his past experiences, informing his actions in the environment. I'm going to pick mix. Nah, I just want to do blueberries. Ooh, blueberries. Berry combs aren't good for tundra. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna go more up. Cause it just seems. Are we gonna take these game last trip? Yep. Oh! I've been told m moose eat this. Yes, that's called lichen. No, what actually lichen is the. Oh, I thought it was moose. already came here. In the presentation today, I've provided a snapshot of five participatory methods for engaging young children as active researchers. While the examples drawn draw from studies on children's environmental identity development in forest and tundra environments in the far north, there are endless possibilities for the application of such methods in various cultural and geographical contexts. In considering which methods to use, I encourage researchers and educators to begin by listening to the ideas and preferences of the children involved in your projects. Children's ideas and perspectives are, more often than not, distinct from our own. 
by taking a step back and providing space for children to exercise their agency, we equip them to be active stewards of culture and change for the betterment of our environments. Thanks very much, Carrie. I uh, appreciate that background. Um, I was sort of laughing to myself as I was watching that video that if I were a coder, I would probably be motion sick. <laughs> Something about those cameras. Um, it's, it's a little, little bit of a mind warp there, but um, that was really very helpful to see that from the child's perspective. So now we're gonna go move on to the more practice portion of our webinar. And here's where we're hearing about what affirming children's voices looks like in an educational practice setting. So I'm gonna turn it over to Natalie Lucas of We One's Daycare and Preschool and Valhalla Children's Center. Thank you. I, um... I was thinking about all of the amazing things that the children in those two programs do day after day. And I thought, oh, I'd love to have everybody hear about these. But most specifically today, I wanted to share our project called The Salmon Speaks. It was the one project that we were able to get funding to um, support in a whole lot of different ways. And it's become almost like our foundation for the. Uh, both centers our to the children's to the child, and we as educators are there to facilitate their learning, support that, and become a part of the group of learning and go towards where team to work. Um, the salmon speaks. It began when there was a lot of discussion about dying, and some of the children found that talking to each other is like, oh yeah, my grandma died, or my dog died, my fish died. There were some that spoke about it a lot, and yet there are others that were curious. And I thought maybe what we could do, this is where I thought if I had something that the quieter children would be able to take time to think and then share when they were ready. So we thought, I thought we were going to set up a fish tank and the children decided they were going to have all kinds of these fish in there. But through the discussions, they realized you can't put a shark in a little fish tank. And what would go into that fish tank and be happy, we, fig we found out it probably is guppies. And the guppies lifespan is very short. So we thought, okay, there there will be births, there will be deaths, and this can continue as long as the children want to. Um, so we did that. But then the discussions led to like, tell us stories about this fish, or what about this fish? And so there were stories about different kinds of fish. And at the end of about 10 stories, I asked them who's the favorite, and they all said it was salmon. And I was surprised. The deep sea angler is a pretty amazing fish living in the dark with his own little fishing pole. But no, that, that that's not important to them. They said that the most important thing was that the salmon had to go through so much things like bears and waterfalls to get all the way home to lay their eggs and have their babies. And that home I realized was really, really important to the entire group of children. And from that, we started talking more about salmon migration. And we have a river, we have a lake, palace sits right off where the river comes out of the land. Eventually, the ocean, they pretty much all of them knew that there was no salmon in there. And so they shared those ideas. Uh, but I, I don't know, I just maybe what I need to do here is to share the story of the Columbia River. And I drew a map of the Columbia and how the salmon used to flow then when the dam, when the dam was built, all of that stopped. And I was told that 
the salmon grand pool they stay linger at the base of the dam waiting and here's the but when the children heard the dam was in the way one It was pretty brief. Natalie, I'm going to interrupt here because your audio has essentially dropped off and no one is able to hear you. I'm so sorry. Um, I think what we'll do now is take a couple of questions from um, the chat box that are directed towards Carrie. And Natalie, okay. I'm wondering if perhaps um, you might try calling in again. Um, not sure what else okay. to do about that. Okay, Carrie, I'll try you... calling on my other phone. Okay. On my other phone. Thank you. Carrie, let's do a couple okay. of questions. And um, Kathy at uh, CNN, if you could watch for um, uh, Natalie calling in on a new phone number, that would be really helpful. Let me um, direct a question from Ruth Wilson to you, Carrie, that has to do with the wearable cameras. Um, she had two questions, actually. One was about, are wearable cameras inexpensive or expensive? How cost prohibitive is that? And does a sensory tour using the wearable camera actually also record the child's voice? And I think we heard the answer to that, but you might speak a little bit to just sort of the technology and what it can do. Sure. Um, so we bought uh, six GoPro cameras back in 2015 for our first project. And amazingly, um, technology doesn't always seem to last, but the GoPro cameras we've used several times for four or five projects now. Um, and they cost about $400 a piece back then. Um, I'm not sure what the costs are um, now for the cameras. We also use the... Um, junior head strap so gopro makes um a, an adult size head strap and a junior size you could also use a chest strap we tried the chest strap with children but they preferred to use the head strap um the head strap is um it can be kind of adjusted to fit the child's head and so we found that you know um kids at this age have all sorts of different heads shapes and sizes and so um, adjusting the camera so it's comfortable is really important it's also very important to make sure that the, the uh, angle of the camera is is not pointing up towards the sky or pointing down but pointing straight ahead so that you can see children's views um and what was the second part of the question um whether you get a voice recording oh yes um so so GoPros, the audio on GoPros um, really is, it, it will not record too much from outside of the child, right? Um, one of the advantages is that it really captures the wearer's voice, but um, if you're using it to capture the whole scene or the sounds of the whole scene, um, I encourage researchers to maybe use um, we use like iPads and we have other cameras going. Um, and we also have um, several kids wearing GoPros at once, uh, which allows us to capture various angles. So we can go back and we can look at, if we're looking at particular instances, um, then we can go back and look at various angles of 
those instances from different ch different children's views and perspectives. So that's really fascinating and interesting. Great, thanks. Um, there's a question about the program, you know, who these children were and kind of what kind of program they were taking part in. Was this sort of a drop-in style program or was it part of a longer or more scheduled kind of program? Well, um, uh, as I just mentioned, we have done um, several different research projects using the GoPro cameras. Um, the first um, project that most of the uh, presentation today was from um, a project that occurred in 2015. Um, and the purpose of that project actually was to uh, explore methods for engaging children as active researchers. So we began with um, uh, what we began with was using the GoPros to kind of see what the kids see in the forest. We reviewed the footage and then we brought it back to the children and asked for what asked them to interpret uh, what was happening and for their ideas and perspective um, and looking at it um, and developed our research questions um, and the topics of interest based off of what how the children responded. Uh, one of the things that the children were very interested in, um, well, there were several, there were five topics, including rose bushes. They were very interested in um, X marks the spot. So that's when um, they, they played, they invented this whole game in the forest about um, sticks crossing. They were also very interested in bugs. Um, we had a group of children that just um, spent most of their time in the forest looking at bugs and houses, forts, and castles. And so, uh, hence there's various names because uh, the children called them different things. Um, and I think um, trees, and I'm probably forgetting one. Okay. But, um, we d basically took their topics and kind of developed the whole project based around what they were interested in. Great, thanks. Um, Natalie is back on the line. So Natalie, if you wanna, jump in here. Um, I'm still on your first slide and you can tell me when to advance. Okay, well, the first one is um, the children on at the river. Yes. And we go on our, reg our regular hikes out into the environment. And this spot here is a really popular place because it's got all kinds of things, um, bushes, branches, um, rocks, of course, sand. And it, it's almost like every time they come, they want to create this river system. And um, I love this picture because every single one of the children was involved with this. And so there's discussion about, you know, we, we're going to put a dam in here and it's going to stop. And so they do. They put the dam in. They watch what, the wa what happens with the water and then how the water goes around and they have to make the dam bigger. Um, anyway, um, we do a lot of, I guess it's uh, natural materials, but out in the environment, and they uh, they basically play what they are learning and learning as they're playing. The sec the second um, slide is the pipe system. It's a drawing. This was a, a drawing that a little boy made because he was determined he was going to help the salmon get past that dam. And so he spent every day that he came for easily over two weeks trying to figure out how he was going to create a dam system so that the fish would get, be able to get by and we could have the electricity because they, most of them understood that dams provide electricity and that was a good thing but not if the salmon weren't going to get through. So he used, he used blocks, he used different kinds of building toys, and uh, he also drew this system where he had figured out that a pipe system for the salmon would be way smaller than a pipe system for the sturgeon. Because we go out to this Columbia River every year to help release the juvenile sturgeon into the river system. Um, the next slide would be um, whoosh technology. 
it looks like a great big uh, hose. Anyway, mm -hmm. when when I'm listening to the the children coming up with ideas of how they're going to um, make this all better for the salmon, a, a lot of their ideas are actually things that people are now uh, looking into and um, checking out to see if it would be uh, workable. And this whoosh technology has been um, created and it's being tested in Washington State around, um, I think it's Yakima, and it's like a vacuum cleaner hose. The fish go into the, uh, um, the pipe and they get sucked right up over the dam and then over even Grand Coulee Dam, which was pretty cool. Um, and there's, and I was thinking about how the one little girl was saying, oh, I'm going to go down to the river and I'm going to scoop them up into baskets and I'm going to carry them up over the, over the dam and let them go and say goodbye, uh, salmon, have a wonderful life. And of course, when we were looking at um, different things that people are doing now, there are elevator systems in dams operating right at this moment in in United States uh, for sure and so I thought oh my gosh you know it's like we these children have come up with something that we as adults are just beginning to think about um, anyway I was pretty proud about that um, the, the next slide is uh, children singing one of the things that we we're thinking, like, as the project continued, we created business cards, we created placemats, and the children went out and shared their own story because we didn't want people to say that we were using children for our own purposes. They were the ones that had to share this. I supported it by creating a logo and these business cards, but they were the ones that spoke about it. And another part of our funded project was that we as educators were supporting learning moments. And so the t-shirt that the children are wearing says just that, educators supporting learning moments. And it's got the logo of the salmon on it. And they're singing their salmon song. And that was another thing that happened during the play after this project began to be discussed. The children began to sing things that they were feeling strongly about, and they were using Baby Beluga Toon. And I thought, okay, if this, if this is going to go out with Baby Beluga Toon, we might get into trouble from Rafi. So I wrote him and told him what was happening with our project. He, told, he wrote back and said, no, he would not give us permission to use the song, but we wanted to honor these children and their songs. And so we found somebody that actually created our our very own original tune. And so the the words that the children were doing, we began to learn the song to the to the, our own original tune. And this is what they're doing. They're singing the song um, that basically they made up and we put together on paper for everybody to learn. Uh, the next one is the child touching the sturgeon. Like I said before, we go down to the uh, river and participate in the sturgeon release. We hope that one day we will be able to go down to the Columbia and participate in a salmon release. Um, the next one, I think, is a little boy who's holding a little toad. Yep. We, we also uh, go up into the Slocan Valley and there is a a place there where the uh, toadies have to cross from the mountainside across the highway and to the lake to lay their eggs. And then the little toadies have to travel across that highway and go up into the mountain. And so there's a lot of them that are run over by the cars. So we might not be able to uh, support salmon in our river system yet, but we go out and we help the little toadies. We find them in the forest along the river or the lake and we take them across the um, road and release them into the mountain. 
And the second one is in front of the Grand Coulee. Mm -hmm. After after we were sharing information here, um, what one little per, one little person said to me, he said, "I have a problem, Natalie." And I said, "Oh my gosh, wh what is your problem?" And he says, "Well, um, I I can't find anybody else to tell this story to." And I thought, okay, well, let's think about this together. And who did you talk to? And, and he goes, no, no. He goes, I've talked to everybody, everybody in my family, everybody in my community, every place my mom goes. But I have to go further. So how am I going to talk my mom into taking me places where we haven't been yet? And I said, well, I can help you with that one. So um, anyway, we decided we needed to go beyond and so the plan was, we need to go to Grand Coulee. And here is uh, uh, the first group of families. There was five of the families that uh, we fundraised money, and we went down and we talked about uh, how we felt about the lack of the salmon because of the dam. We visited the dam. We went into the dam, um, and the children learned firsthand how totally immense this thing is and I think the second or the next one is where the children are inside the dam mm -hmm. and where I actually use cameras um, when we go on special uh, well like going to Grand Coulee every single one of those children had a camera they documented what was important to them so that they can bring back these pictures and share with uh, other children and families that couldn't go, and then also share with their community. And then the last one is a quote from the Lorax. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that one, uh, I when I read that, I thought, this is it. These children are living proof that people or children care so much about things that are around them, and they care deeply about living creatures and their living environment. And um, I just had to end these pictures with that that quote. And uh, I think there's a picture there with uh, a dead kokanee salmon, and two little girls are looking down at it and feeling really um, sad. With we go up to the um, Kootenai Lake and there they have the landlocked salmon and they the the children participate in a field trip to visit that area and they see the process of how the salmon come up the creeks and lay their eggs and of course there's dead salmon all over and they see the bear coming to go fishing and the ducks trying to eat the eggs and um, it's all on a small scale what we hope one day will happen here in our river system with the salmon. All right. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, and so sorry for your uh, audio problems there, but you seem to have fixed them. So glad we were able to return to you. Um, some great questions have been appearing in the chat and um, a lot of them were directed at Carrie and she has been responding in the chat to a lot of your questions. Just wanted to let you know that we will be um, disseminating a transcript of that chat to you in the coming weeks. And so you will have a record of all of these questions and answers. Um, given that we had a chance to talk to Carrie a little bit um, in answer to some of your questions, I'm wondering if anyone has a question specifically for Natalie. I don't think I see one um, in the chat, but if you did ask one, you might wanna repeat it so that I see it at the top of the list here. Um, I had one um, for you, Natalie. I found it very inspiring that you were really playing off of the children's interests and stated concerns, and um, they might not always know exactly what to do with those concerns and interests, but you were able to sort of lift those up and 
sort of move it to the next level, you know, going to the dam or, you know, this sort of thing and sort of educating others, getting the kids to to talk to members in their, their community or supporting them in, in doing that if they wanted to. I'm wondering about what do you know about the children who are now no longer in your care? Um, has this impacted them in some way that you have been able to um, to learn about from families or from, from prior students? What I've found with, uh, I guess what it is, is following the children's lead, but listening to them, what happens is they become really connected as a group and they their confidence increases. They don't look at me as teacher and then knowing everything and being the solver of their problems. They are begin to feel like they can do that. And what I've heard from the children that began this project and are now in high school, uh, they are confident human beings. Uh, I know one of the families, I, they, every the three children came to the program, and then their cousins, three others, came to the program. And I see them being a really um, outspoken in their community. They have a sense of what is right, and they have a sense of confidence to try to do things towards that. And uh, I, I tell uh, one little boy, I say, you're going to be the mayor, because he already is in a position where he feels strong enough to support his, his uh, friends in the environment, and he feels like he can do it, and he wants to do it, and I don't know, it's like, it's like it becomes a magical place where I am the observer and the supporter instead of being the teacher that's supposed to have all these answers. And I see them growing and being that way too. So I have no doubt that these, one of these children are going to end up being the mayor of Slocan. <laughs> That's great. Um, Another thing that I was going to say is that when we, like, when we uh, support the children and how they see things and what they want to do, what happens also is the children help the parents understand their capacity way more so, and then there's a relationship that begins to uh, build and grow with children, parents, and the educators. We're not just preschool teachers. We're not just babysitters. We are actually somebody that's doing something so valuable to their children, and that's what I've been told. It's like uh, you are um, supporting my child to be a citizen of the world. And I'm thinking, yes, <laughs> that's it. That's what I want. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, Meg from Chicago asked if there were other areas of interest that the children found when they worked with the Gubby, with the, um, the Gubby tank. What else were they vocalizing that were areas of interest for them? Every day it seems like, well, they, they really liked the guppies, but they also wanted to get to understand about other kinds of fish. And so we did talk a, a lot about, you know, the angels and what what are the angelfish compared to the guppies. Um, it, it seemed to take second place because the salmon story seemed to just grab them and move them forward. But o over the time since that story, there's been a lot of different projects that we have been part of. And... Um, because we live in an area where there's mountains on both sides and then there's a river and a lake, uh, the river, the, the lake is really important environment for the, for the children that are in there. And so a lot of the projects have to do with that river and the lake and the plant life that they see uh, when they're traveling through on, our, on the hikes. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, Peter from Courtney 
British Columbia mentioned that uh, you hadn't said this, but that field trip to the Grand Coulee Dam was more than a 200 mile trip from the Slocan Valley and it crosses the US Canadian border. And so that's that's a big deal for these little, little kids and their families. Um, so it's a pretty amazing experience to provide for you know, our, our youngest uh, nature engaged students. Yeah, and we weren't able to access any grants because we're crossing an international border. Mm -hmm. So the families all baked cookies and we, we were able to sell enough cookies to finance the trip. Um, we stayed in motels, uh, motel rooms down there. And what I was quite impressed with is like you go into in this environment and you're meeting people and you're seeing things and you're talking to people. And then months later, I hear in, from a person that I know from the United States who is, uh, for, works with the uh, Washington Forest Service. She had gone to Seattle to a conference with the fish and wildlife people, and she came back saying, do you know what everybody's talking about? And, uh, of course, I didn't. And she said, it's the group of children that came from Canada that were protesting the loss of the salmon. Mm. And so I thought, yes, that's mm. powerful. Yes. That is very powerful. Um, yeah. What an amazing sort of civic environmental experience these kids have had. Um, there's just one more comment in the chat pertaining to you, um, Natalie, and we'll we'll deal with it after the webinar, which is um, that they're asking for a book list for the fish stories you mentioned. So you and I will communicate um, about uh, some titles and we'll put that back out when we send out a resource list uh, after the webinar in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. Okay. So I wanna thank, um, Carrie Green and Natalie Lucas, and I want to thank Natural Start Alliance, and I want to thank all of you for your great questions, your interest uh, in affirming the right of young children to be heard as research participants and as participants in nature-based early childhood programming, and also thank you for the good work you're doing to connect children to nature. So as I mentioned earlier, this webinar has been recorded and we'll make it available via follow-up email, and it will be on our website at Children and Nature Network. We'll also be sending a transcript of the chat and we'll prepare a resource sheet in which we document our responses to all of your questions, or at least as many of them as we can that you've been posing in the chat. Um, please feel free to share this recording and that resource sheet with uh, your colleagues who perhaps couldn't be with us uh, today. Um, and so thank you so much uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you on another Making the Case webinar.